I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, I have here with me Dr. Simone Bernstein. She is a psychiatry resident at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, and she is co-founder of Inside the Match. Welcome, Dr. Bernstein. Today, we will be discussing Match Day and the creation of Inside the Match. So please welcome Dr. Bernstein. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to speak all about the match and the way that we can help applicants throughout this process. And we're excited to have you. So my first question for you is, for our listeners who don't know, can you explain a little bit more about what Match Day is? So Match Day is one of the most exciting days for medical school students. It is a day when the National Resident Matching Program, or NRMP, releases the results of applicants who have applied for residency training programs in the United States. The urology and ophthalmology match day is actually in February, whereas the other specialties will match in March. So for example, this year, on March 13th, applicants will learn whether or not they have matched And then later in that week on Friday, they will actually find out if they have matched where they are going for residency. So it's an entire week long process that is the culmination of either a fourth year medical school student or someone who has already graduated who is applying for the match. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you and your husband created Inside the Match. Can you tell us more about this incredible platform? So our mission through Inside the Match is to provide free and equitable opportunities as well as transparency about the residency match process. So in September of 2020, amidst COVID-19, there was this big transition to virtual interviews. And we Mm -hmm. recognized that there was this lack of guidance and support for a lot of residency applicants. A lot of programs were overwhelmed as they were transitioning into the virtual interview sphere. And medical school students weren't quite sure how the virtual interviews would work. So we all know that the residency match process can be really stressful. Mm -hmm. But what we decided was that if we have a large community of people that are willing to support and guide applicants through the process, it makes it a lot easier for applicants to feel like they have a community of support to go through to ask questions and also get advice. So our goal is to really provide guidance throughout the match process and wisdom from residents and leaders in medical education. That's excellent. What types of resources does Inside the Match provide for match applicants? Well, we started out on social media as a podcast, and we recognized that as our podcast became more popular, we wanted to have alternative options for people to gain extra guidance and support. So we then launched a website in October of 2021, which is www.insidethematch.com, and that has blog posts and tips for medical school the match application process, residency, and also research. Because what we recognized is, is that as people prepare for the match, as they are in medical school in their first, second, or third years, there's lots of questions that people had about clinical rotations as well as preclinicals. And so we wanted to provide support not only directly during the time they were applying for the match, but also before then when they were preparing And then afterwards, when they were about to start their intern year and preparation for residency. The residency application process can be really overwhelming, uh, you know, as some of the, the items that you just mentioned. What recommendations do you have for applicants to help reduce stress during the application process? What can you share with us? So I like to break this down into three steps in order to help prepare for the application process. 
So number one, if you are applying in the fall, my recommendation is to make a draft of a timeline and make that draft in June in order to ensure that you will have the completed application by September, which is the time that applicants will apply. So within that timeline, you can identify when you plan to start like writing a personal statement, when you are going to complete the experience section of the ERAS application. And also you can start making that list of residency programs that you want to apply to. So if you think of the application in a stepwise fashion, where you write your personal statement, you complete your ERAS application, and then you start thinking about which residency programs you want to apply to, it might just feel a little bit less overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. my second big thing is that this process is so stressful that I really think it's important to take breaks throughout the process. So if you spend like a few hours a week working on your application throughout the summer between like June and September, rather than procrastinating, which many of us do, and spend (laughs) like multiple full days working on the application close to the submission deadline in September, it just makes it so much more challenging and so much more mentally draining. So I would Mm -hmm. really advise trying to not only break it up into steps, but also taking breaks and enjoying the time that you have before you actually hit submit. The third thing that I would recommend is to really reach out to your mentors early to ask for guidance. So mentors can be so supportive and helpful during this entire process. But if you ask them way too late in the season, a week before your application is due, they may not be as helpful. So ask them to meet with you earlier in the summer to review your list of residency programs you plan to apply to and to help you brainstorm how you want to put together your application. It'll be easier to meet with them earlier and maybe you can even set up multiple meetings throughout the summer months rather than waiting until the end. Mm -hmm. That's such great advice. Thank you for sharing that with us. What happens if someone does not match? What recommendations do you have for unmatched applicants? So the match process is super stressful, but it is even harder for those that go unmatched. And unfortunately, every year applicants go unmatched or may not match into the specialty that they were hopeful for. So if you don't match during the match week, you can go through the supplemental offer and acceptance program, which is called the SOAP process. So there is a very specific scheduled timeline for the SOAP program, and this is released online by the NRMP. So there are different offer rounds where unmatched applicants will go through and either interview with programs, submit their CV and ERAS application to different programs in hopes that they will get interviews. Unfortunately, some applicants do not get interviews during the SOAP process or some applicants do not match through the SOAP process. So... For those applicants, it's really important that you consider either a research year, a job, a graduate degree. It's important to start thinking about what your plans might be if you do not match. Match day is one day, just one day out of the year. How do medical students prepare for this day? How do they prepare for the entire match application process? What can you share with us? So it's really important when you're preparing for the match application process to reach out to your network. And your network can be broad. Your network can be family. It can be peers. It can be those who have graduated from your medical school recently or and are now in residency in your specialty of choice. It can also be residents that are at your medical school. So it's really important that you think about a broad network of people that you can talk to and get advice from. Mm -hmm. My motto is, is if you can meet with someone and even get just one piece of new advice from that meeting, it is worthwhile of the time that you spent. So we all know that this application process is hard and it's very stressful. So it's very important to think about how you are going to use your network to be able to prepare 
So for example, let's say you want to get practice on your residency interviews. You could even ask one of your parents to help set up a mock interview with you. A mock interview does not necessarily need to be with somebody within the field of medicine. It just Mm -hmm. needs to be with somebody that can look at you and your body language and assess that and also assess your answers to your questions and see how comfortable you seem with answering some of the questions that they ask. Right, right. Well, that's great advice. So you are a psychiatry resident. When you applied to the match, how did you select programs to apply to? That's a great question because it is so hard when you think about the vast array of programs that exist throughout the country. There are programs in all different states. There are programs that are smaller. There are programs that are larger. But what I recommend is that you create a list of your top three priorities. And why I say this is because if you have a long list of 10 to 12 things that you're looking for, That's wonderful and might be really helpful, but it could be a little bit more challenging to figure out what specific programs to apply to based upon that list when you're just starting out trying to figure out where to apply. So start with a smaller list of about three priorities. So my priorities included like geographic proximity to family. I'm from the Midwest and was hopeful to come home. Mm-hmm. I really wanted some like teaching opportunities within medical education. And then I also was really interested in opportunities to engage in research. So then I looked at cities where I was nearby family to reach that geographic proximity priority. And then I looked at opportunities where I was working with medical school students for my second priority. And then I looked at, for my third priority of research, trying to find institutions that had mentors that were working on medical education and or leadership projects. So it's really important for people to realize that no matter the specialty, a lot of the ACGME requirements are very specialty specific. Therefore, curriculum may not be different depending upon the program you're looking at, but there's going to be a lot of differences in what they focus on in regards to medical education or research or even the number of vacation days or the number of surgeries if you're like looking at a surgical field or the patient population. Mm -hmm. So there's just so many different things that can be a part of your priority list. But my thought is start with a smaller list of priorities and then get more detailed as you go on, especially during the interview process. And you're trying to figure out what program might be even better for you than another program on your list. Hmm. That's great. Great advice. What has your experience been like in your residency program as a psychiatry resident? So residency is exhausting. (laughs) <laughs> Intern year can be really hard. You have a lot of call days uh, and it can be really challenging just to recognize that you're working six days a week out of seven mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. abnormal it can be just to have a standard weekend of a Saturday and a Sunday. But overall, what I have recognized is that I really enjoy the specialty that I'm in. And I am very glad that I focused on those priorities when looking at a specific program and realized that as I engaged with work that I was passionate about, like medical education research, mentoring residency applicants and teaching medical school students, I really realized what sort of my potential career could look like. Mm -hmm. So alongside my interest in education... I approached my program director and asked if I could look at obtaining a master in health professions education. And this has really been a great opportunity for me to combine my interest in medicine and education. So my thought is to really look at where things may look for you in 10 to 15 years and figure out how you can develop your own education within residency outside of what the standard curriculum might look like. Right, right. Wow, that's that's great. 
So that takes me to uh, my final question, which is what other pieces of advice would you like to leave for future match applicants in all specialties? So the match process, like we've described, can be so super duper stressful. (laughs) But I really want applicants to remember that through Inside the Match, we have this large community that's excited to support applicants with guidance through our blogs or our social media uh, or through our podcasts. And even if you don't have a, a large network of mentors or supporters that are there for you, the process We want to be able to help you find that. And Mm -hmm. a mentor is somebody that can be a resident. It can be a faculty member you've worked with on a rotation. But it's really important that you develop that level of support so you can go to someone with questions throughout the process. Because that mentor can be someone who reviews your personal statement. They may Mm -hmm. be writing you that strong letter of recommendation. And they may even help you determine which programs that would be best for you based upon your interactions with them. And then my second piece of advice for people applying to all specialties, no matter their background, is that it's important to be prepared for the possibility of not matching. Unfortunately, not everyone will match in our current system. So at the beginning of the application process, not just at the end when you find out you don't match, But it's important at the beginning of the application process to speak with your mentors and consider alternative options and whether or not you will go through the SOAP process or whether or not you will look for a job or a research year. It is always important to have a backup plan no matter the type of applicant you are, no matter what your standardized exam scores and what your grades and what your letters of recommendation and supporters may say about you, it is very important to stay humble and realize that a backup plan is always key to have. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing all of this wonderful information with us. Um, And before we leave, I did want to mention that you also have a podcast called Inside the Match. And um, we will include the link in the show notes. But could you share with our listeners, um, where can they find that podcast? So our podcast is listed uh, in Apple as well as Spotify and Google Podcasts. And we have interviews with program directors, residents, fellows, as well as leaders in medical education with the goal to provide you as much transparency and help throughout this match process. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Simone. Thank you for being on our show today. Thank you, Sabrina. It was so wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today.